Amen. Praise the Lord. We welcome you to Thursday evening worship service. Praise God. It's going to be a preaching broadcast today, uh, being that we're just live streaming right now. Praise the Lord. But we welcome all those who are watching us via live stream. And we're excited about what the Lord is doing. God is continuing to bless. Praise God. God is still God. And we, we love him and appreciate him for who he is. Amen. And when men and women are able to appreciate the Lord for who he is, regardless of the circumstances in which we face, regardless of the things that we go through, and the devil likes to hype things up and to say, oh, but just, you know, kind of get your eyes on your circumstances. Get your eyes on the things that you're going through. Get your eyes on the things that aren't going well. Uh, get your eyes on the things that are going well. That, you know, when you begin to look a little bit too highly on the things that are going uh, really well and thank the Lord for the things that are going well. But at the same time, uh, those things can kind of deceive a person into a false sense of security. Praise God. Why? Because our confidence in our security is not on the circumstances of this life because this isn't our home. Praise God. But we know that we have a home in heaven and Jesus one of these days is going to come back and take a, a, his church home. Praise the Lord. And so we're excited about what the Lord is doing. Thursday evening worship service. We're going to be preaching right now. And our next broadcast is going to be this upcoming Sunday at 11 a.m. And so be staying in tune. Be staying to uh, stay tuned uh, for that. And. Uh, looking forward to God's continued blessing. And in the meantime, though right now I'm not able to uh, bring people to the, physically to the church, uh, per se, being that we have the services closed for, uh, for these next uh, 10 days, but uh, you can invite many women to watch the broadcast. Praise God. And people are doing that. People are watching the broadcasts. And and uh, God's touching hearts and lives through his word. Praise the Lord. And give all the glory unto Almighty God. God is in control. Praise God. And so we're looking forward to God's continued blessing. But we welcome you tonight to this broadcast. And uh, we're going to look to the Lord uh, in prayer. And I'm going to ask Reverend Riley, sir, if you go ahead and stand and ask God's blessing uh, for this service and also for the message tonight. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. We're going to be preaching this evening from the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to begin to read from verse 24, a very familiar portion of Scripture to those who read their Bibles. If you're not a studier of the Word of God, of course, this would not be familiar to you, but we'll be preaching about it and talking about it. Amen. Sharing, um, sharing the Word of God. And our prayer is, is that God's word will touch your heart. And so we're going to be, begin to read from verse 24, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 15, verse 24. Jesus begins to speak here. He said, but he answered and said, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Verse 25, then came she and worshiped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, Great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. And with the help of the Lord this evening, we're wanting to preach from this uh, portion of scripture tonight on the title, You Can Have What You Need. You can have what you need. And so amongst all of the tasks, that the Lord Jesus Christ was given 
on earth to do. We know that the Lord had testified and said that he was sent of the Father into the world, our Heavenly Father, God the Father, into the world, and he was here on a mission, and amongst all of the uh, tasks that he was given to do, he, he, he worked miracles. He raised the dead. With his words, Jesus was like e Ezekiel. When you read in the book of Ezekiel of the valley of the dry bones, many who are familiar with the Bible know what I'm talking about. And there the prophet Ezekiel, the Lord had challenged him to speak unto this valley of dry bones. And when he had preached, uh, the Bible began to share that there was uh, a, a, a um, the flesh had begun to come back to those bones and the sinew. And, and then afterward, he uh, continued to prophesy and uh, there was eventually standing a great army. In other words, God, through the mouth of the prophet and through the promise of his word, had raised up what was a valley of dry, white, uh, clean, picked bones. God raised up the army and resurrected them again. A true and great miracle. But Jesus came into a world and taking from that and figuratively speaking, was preaching to a bunch of dry bones. People whose lives, though they were alive, they weren't a, a valley of literal dry bones as uh, the prophet Ezekiel had experienced, but a people whose faith had been dry. A people whose livelihoods had become dry and humdrum. A, a people who were just kind of going through a, an existence and they were following after religious traditions uh, and ceremonies, uh, but yet there was not anything really truly significantly fulfilled in their lives. They were detached from a real true relationship with Almighty God, being God's promised people being the very people in whom God had laid much promise and, and shared great things that were going to be done. But we see that even in the midst of all of this promise, in the midst of all of God's word uh, that had been spoken and had been, pre had been preached, um, this people's history had been, uh, you see, a line of the supernatural acts of Almighty God throughout the, the children of Israel's history. But yet they got to the place to where when Jesus arrived on earth, uh, uh, that they were dry in their lives. They were like this army that was of this valley of dry bones. And the word of God needed to be preached unto them but preached in a reality, preached in the power and demonstration of the Holy Spirit, and that's what Jesus did. And when Jesus began to preach to these people, there was life uh, that had come back uh, in, into them. Uh, sinew and, and, and blood and veins and all of the it, things had begun to uh, uh, flow in their lives. So where now a uh, faith uh, had risen up and now began to demonstrate itself uh, in the acts of these people. He spoke and that which was not existent had come into existence, talking about faith. You can have what you need. And what men and women need in their life is faith in hope in Almighty God. When you have faith and hope in Almighty God and you are looking at God for who He is, faith and hope in a God who is not contingent upon the circumstances of our life, we see the Lord God, the Bible tells us that the Lord God is holy. He is righteous. He is holy. But he is righteous and he is holy because of who he is. You see, God's holiness and God's righteousness and God's standard does not need mankind's permission to be so. Man does not have to give God 
his seal of approval in order for God to be holy. Now, man may deny the Lord praise and they may deny the Lord credibility. They may deny the Lord his due as to him being holy and he being worthy of worship. But just but that's simply because man is void of God. That's because they do not know him. That's because they do not understand him. That's why men uh, would not praise the Lord. If men and women understand, understood who God is and, uh, and, and realized who God is and accepted God for who he is, then they would begin to praise. Then they would begin to worship. Then they would begin to seek him and reach out to him. But mankind in his pride rises up and believes that uh, God can only be holy uh, except with their permission. That somehow man has to give God permission. God does not need your permission to be holy. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. He is all powerful. Amen. He is all knowing and he is above all. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts than our thoughts. His mind, his wisdom than our wisdom. And so that's why God continues, uh, continues to make uh, the wicked look so foolish uh, in their unbelief uh, and in their denial of him. But the day is going to come, friend, and the Bible says that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. What are we talking about today? We're talking about you can have what you need, but you can't get what you need, friend, until you acknowledge God for who he is. And that's what we see this, uh, this woman here in our scripture text is doing here in uh, Matthew chapter 15. No doubt I could ask if the chapel were full and I can ask those who are watching this broadcast tonight if you had a need in your life. And I would suspect that everyone listening me, to me this evening uh, or would listen to this recording uh, would have, and at the time of you listening to it, could think of, of a need that you have in your life. Some people are facing some devastating uh, uh, situations. Uh, some are, are facing death. Some are facing sickness and death. Some are facing financial difficulty. Some are facing problems uh, within the family and so on. Many, on and on, many different problems. But you see, in the midst of the problem, you need someone who can help you. Now, I know that there are a lot of uh, politicians out there that are doing a lot of promising and reaching out and sharing that they are the ones that if you elect them, that they will solve your problems. So it has been for decade after decade after decade, and the problems seemingly just continue to get worse and worse and worse. And then people begin to try and look for something else uh, uh, to blame uh, for their failures. But you see, friend, there is a God in heaven who has never failed. There is a God in heaven who is holy, who is righteous, and he is holy and he is righteous because he is and because of who he is. Amen. And because he is all powerful and he is not contingent upon man's interpretation of what a holy God is. Man's interpretation of what a holy God is and what a righteous God is, is it may be deteriorated to the point to where man would begin to interpret a righteous and holy God to be a God who gives them what they want. A God who does what they want. A God who does things according to their level uh, and, and uh, uh, of morality and so forth. But you see, God doesn't do things our way. Amen? Jesus came into this world. You see what happens in the world today. All you got to do is go on social media, go on news media, what have you, and see what happens when mankind does things their way. Amen. 
But friend, there's a God in heaven who Jesus made the declaration. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He said, no man can come unto the Father but by me. If you come to Jesus, friend, he is the true way. What is he the way of? He's the way of eternal life. What is he the way of? He's the way of eternal blessings. Not just temporal blessings, but he is of eternal blessings. You see, as we shared earlier, this isn't our home. Sometimes people are looking at God based on the temporal, based on the here and the now. And because God does not do what we want uh, in the here and the now, then therefore they are not willing to believe Him for eternity. Oh, but friend, God can affect the here and now, but you got to believe Him as far as eternity. Because Jesus made the declaration, He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it uh, that you might have it for all eternity. He came that we might have abundant life. Abundant life. He came that we might have eternal life. Amen. That's what God wants. He, want, he came and sent Jesus that we might have eternal life. So we see this woman here in our scripture reading who had a desperate need in her life. She was suffering. Why? Because her child was ill. Her child was sick. And she needed something other than what mankind had to offer in order to remedy her situation. The Bible declares that she was a Syrophoenician woman. She was a Gentile. She was a, a, a daughter of that was born outside of, of the Jewish heritage. She was not of the Jewish line, but yet she heard about Jesus. Friend, that's all you need. In your life, it doesn't matter where you came from. It doesn't matter your ethnicity. It doesn't matter what your financial standing is, whether you have money, don't have money, have friends, don't have friends. It does not matter. Friend, all you have to do is hear about Jesus. This woman, not being raised up in the uh, educational institutions of, uh, of the Jewish uh, heritage, she was not raised up a Jew. She was not raised up hearing the stories of, of Noah uh, making the ark. She was not raised up knowing uh, uh, the stories of uh, uh, Adam and Eve and, and, and Moses and stretching out his rod and the children of Israel crossing over the Red Sea, uh, cross, crossing through the Red Sea on dry ground. How that Moses went into Egypt and delivered the children. They, she, didn't, she wasn't raised up hearing all of that. But she heard about this man that was able to heal people. A man who was able to change people's lives. We had a revival banner some years ago when I was pastoring in Seattle. And it said, if you've tried everything else. Why not now try Jesus? Why not try Jesus? And not that you should try Jesus as a last resort, but unfortunately, that's what a lot of people do. A lot of people go more with the familiar, with the immediate, with what they uh, may count as more credible. But when that which you have counted on all these years fails you, then that's when men and women begin to look elsewhere for a solution. I don't know how long it had been that this woman had been searching for a solution to her, her, her daughter's problem. This, uh, this is what was going on in her life. But she desperately needed that her daughter would be healed. She came. She came to Jesus because she was concerned for her daughter. She was uh, uh, possessed with um, uh, an evil spirit and she needed a healing in her life. 
The Bible shares that how that this woman was crying out unto the Lord. And she was desperately seeking that he would come and heal and heal her. In the word of, in, in the gospel of Mark, it tells us there in chapter 7 and verse 25, it talks about the same account. The gospel of Mark 7, 25, it said that she heard of him. As you shared, that's what you need. You need to hear Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing the word of God and she realized that if this man whom she heard about if he can do all these things for all of these other people if he can heal them if he can cast out demons if he can deliver them from the grip of the enemy then perhaps he can do the same for me and friend if God had ever changed the life of an individual, talking, preaching tonight about if you, that you can have what you need. This woman had a need in her life. And she figured and understood that this man was able to change her life. This woman came to Jesus because faith and hope had been sparked in her heart and life. And she needed something that, as we share, society could not provide. She was looking for something uh, that her dead religion uh, had been powerless to do for her. She needed a solution. Friend, do you need a solution? There's a God in heaven who's able to bring a solution to your life. What this woman had was faith. And in looking at this faith that this woman had, we want to share about faith's obstacles, faith's opportunities, faith's obligations, and faith's rewards. Faith's obstacles, faith's opportunities, faith's obligations, and faith's rewards. Faith was born in her life. But how do we know what kind of faith she had? You see, sometimes people's faith is contingent upon circumstances. It's contingent upon that which is favorable. It's contingent upon what makes sense to them. But we see that this woman had a genuine faith to where her faith had plowed through the obstacles. It had seized upon the opportunities. It was able to meet the obligations and experience the reward. Let's look at some of the obstacles that this woman had in her life when she came to Jesus. She comes to Jesus for help and when she does, she doesn't get the response that one would immediately think she would get. She says uh, she stays after Jesus until she gets what she wants though. To see that her need was met and her daughter healed was uh, an absolute paramount in her life. It seemed that uh, everything would go wrong. It seemed everything was going wrong when she came. She may have had some friends uh, that were with her and maybe they were trying to sway her and to, and to say, wait a minute, don't, don't mess with this guy. They, these are Jews. You're a Syrophoenician. They don't, they, they're not going to, uh, he's not really going to do anything for you. But this woman prevailed. She didn't allow anything to uh, push her back. As we shared, she was a, a Gentile, a Canaanite, a Syrophoenician, a woman from Tyre and Sidon. She was a descendant of a cursed people. And she had these things against her, but yet she did not allow where she came from to stop her. She had overcome a religion former beliefs and things that she was taught and had always grew up to believe. 
She had to avoid, she had to overcome obstacles of race and, and them trying to deny her. Jesus himself had even declared that he was come to the children of Israel. And that it was not right for him to take that which pertained to the children and cast it to the dogs. This, once again, would not necessarily be something that she immediately was uh, uh, ready to experience. But she knew something within her that a God who was holy, righteous, and just, one who was supreme and all-powerful, that if she would just seize upon who he is, not necessarily giving him permission to heal the child, but she realized that he was the only one that could do anything for her child. There is a difference. You know, sometimes people approach God as though they are going to give God an opportunity and a, the privilege of blessing them. Sometimes people may approach God and give God permission to bless them. God, I'm going to give you the permission to bless me. And I'm even going to allow you to have a little bit of the credit for blessing me. I'm going to call upon you and God, you're going to have the credit of doing this in my life. Friend, God does not necessarily need that from us. What God needs from us is for us to acknowledge Him. Once again, it is not contingent upon our approval. It's not contingent upon whether God knows our heart. The Bible even tells us that God is a studier of the heart. To where He knows the very thought and intent of our heart. God knows whether our faith is true and pure to where we are believing in him for who he is regardless of the circumstances or whether we are coming to him to see what he would do you know there's a part in the gospels where the bible said that they came to him and to see what he would do they wanted to see what the Lord would do in certain situations. They wanted to see whether he was going to heal, whether he was going to bless, whether he was going to act this way or that. They wanted to see what he was going to do instead of believing in who he is. This woman did not approach, though I really believe that deep in her heart, she had fully committed herself unto the Lord. And we see this commitment because uh, when uh, there was resistance, uh, when the disciples tried to push her away, when they went to the Lord and said, this woman, she's bothering us. Why don't you send her away? Why don't you do, why don't you do this, Lord? And, and, uh, and she would not be turned away. She was committed. Is your faith able to face those type of obstacles? Is your faith that type of faith that is contingent upon, well, I'll see what happens. Well, if he does what I want, then I will uh, accept him. Then I will believe in him. No, friend, our faith has to be that which is committed unto him for who he is. For, for him uh, being God God in heaven, realizing he is all powerful, he is almighty, regardless of the circumstances. Now that goes against the conventional wisdom of this world. That's why the world would look at the church and say that the church is so foolish for believing in a God that would allow these different things to take place in the world. And they, they themselves basically would say they don't see it. They don't see it. They don't understand it. But you see, friend, to them who received him, to them gave he power to be the sons of God. She seized upon this opportunity of the Lord Jesus Christ being right there present and she can make her plea before him. 
as Jesus speaks to this woman, the Bible shows how that he never necessarily really slammed the door in her face. In, Mark, in the Gospel of Mark's account, once again in chapter 7, this same account is there. Uh, he records that Jesus said to her, let the children first be filled. The word first was, uh, uh, was what this broken-hearted mother needed to hear. Jesus didn't say you cannot have what you are looking for. He said, I have come to the children of Israel first, and they must first be filled. She took that to mean uh, that seconds were available. Oh, friend, even if it means seconds, when you're talking about the table of Almighty God, when you're talking about the blessings of the Lord, seconds, thirds, scraps from the, from the, from the left or does it not matter, friend? Even that is enough for you to receive what you have need of in your life. You see, these obstacles that were thrown up by the Lord Jesus were not placed there necessarily for the purpose of discouraging and defeating this woman. The obstacles were placed there to authenticate the faith that she came claiming to believe the Lord. In verse 22 of this chapter, she calls on Jesus based on his role as the Jewish Messiah. She receives no help there, but she has uh, and she, she has no right to approach him on those grounds. But on verses 24 and 25, she hears Jesus tell her of his mission on earth, and that was to the nation of Israel. In verses 26 and 27, now she hears that Jesus compares her to a dog. These Gentiles as dogs, the Jews looked at all non-Jews and uh, Jewish people as dogs. The word they used here refers to a mangy cur. It is used as a metaphor of a people who are unclean, filthy, and dirty. Jesus used uh, uh, this word on various occasions. Uh, uh, here in Matthew, uh, in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 6. And the word used here is different. The word means little puppies. It refers not to, a, to mangy, dirty dogs, but to a dog that is a, a pet in the house. To an animal that, uh, that is uh, looked on as a part of the family. Jesus here, no doubt, may have uh, had a, a slip, uh, just, just absolutely uh, had a twinkle in his eye, as one person put it, there in a waiting to see what this woman would do, and as she would fulfill faith's obligations. She took the opportunity and she met the obligations. You know, a lot of people would have thrown up their hands at this point. Why? Because their faith was not whole. Their faith was contingent. Their faith was only partial. It was not whole. But this woman's faith was absolutely whole. She could have threw up her hands and said, I don't need this. I don't need to be talked to like that. I don't need to re be referred to. Who, who are you to disrespect me in that way? Well, we see that Jesus on many occasions had been disrespected, but yet he continued to prevail on in the mission. He still continued on and fulfilled that which the Father had sent him to do. Even there on the cross, uh, when uh, they were wagging their heads and yelling and screaming at him and daring him to come down from the cross, Jesus prayed for them and he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Faith's obligations is that we must fulfill uh, the will of the Father regardless uh, of and to see the mission through all the way unto the end. To not have a give up attitude. Faith does not give up. Faith does 
not look at the circumstances and say, oh, well, I guess it was not meant to be. You know, sometimes a person may fail in their life, but, but, the, but the absolute callings of the Lord, the Bible tells us that the callings of the Lord are without repentance. You know, a person may fail in their life, but it does not mean that God did not mean for you to have it. God did not mean for you to accomplish it. God did not mean for you to fulfill it. And as I was listening to one minister on Facebook, he reminded us of what a Pastor Davis used to say. And it really spoke to my heart. He talked about that Pastor Davis used to say that a failure is a failure to pray. A failure in one's life is a failure to pray. And that so spoke to me. And I remember Pastor Davis sharing that. And it is so true. A failure is a failure to pray. And just because someone had failed to pray, amen, and a person had failed in their life, does that mean that God did not meant for salvation to be real in your life? God did not mean for you to fulfill your call. God did not mean for you to accomplish that which he had called you to accomplish. Don't look at the circumstances. Look at Almighty God. Don't look at your failure. Look at Almighty God. Don't look at what happened. Look at what can happen when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus. When you put your faith and trust in Him, oh friend, that's when things can turn around. Amen. You may have failed in your life, but it does not mean that God does not mean for you to have success. There are obligations that come with faith. You have to see it all the way through. People will tell you to quit. The devil will tell you to quit. Circumstances, finances will tell you to quit. Uh, and, and people and on and on, different ones, uh, even sometimes leaders will tell you to quit. But friend, you must never quit. Never back down. Go forward and be what God would have you to do. And be. You see, this woman here, she wasn't about to back down. Even though her disciples were trying to get her to back down. But she prevailed and she saw it all the way through to faith's rewards. To faith's rewards. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 7 and 8. Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, he said, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them who diligently seek him. The word rewarder in this verse comes from the word mistapodosia. And it means, it comes from, it's a, it's a compound word, and it comes from words that mean uh, wages and to give out. Wages and to give out. Literally, it refers to the paying of wages and thus conveys the sense of a recompense, whether in the form of a reward and also punishment. But here Jesus was ready to recompense this woman a reward because she believed him for who he is. Not for only for what he can do for her. Do we believe God simply only because of what God can do for us? And then all of a sudden, if God doesn't do, our faith fades away? Or do we believe in him like Job did and had confidence and he said, though he slay me, yet will I believe, trust in him. Yet will I believe him. Yet will I serve him. He had that full commitment of faith unto the Lord. And she reaped the reward. And when she, after Jesus had said, 
to her it is not meet to give the children's bread and cast it to the dogs. She said, truth, Lord. Everything that comes out of your mouth is truth. Everything that comes out of your mouth, God, is right. Amen? But even the dogs, even the dogs, they eat from the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And it's almost as though Jesus was saying, woman, that's what I was waiting for. That's what I was waiting to hear from you. Talking about you can have what you need. And this woman, then Jesus had said to her, O oh woman, great is thy faith. Your faith is real. Your faith is pure. Your faith uh, had met the obligation and you are now going to experience its reward. He said, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Oh, friend, when we approach God in that way, with a full committed faith unto the Lord, regardless of the circumstances, the Bible said, and her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Oh, friend, you can have what you're looking for in your life, and especially when it comes to salvation, especially when it comes to the born again experience, especially when it comes to the power of the Holy Ghost, especially when it comes from forgiveness of Almighty God. Friend, you can have what you are looking for and you need in your life, and everyone needs Jesus. Let's pray. Loving Father, we thank you, God, for your word. Thank you for your promises. Thank you, Lord, for this portion of Scripture, God, which share unto us the promises that come from your throne room. We ask you, Lord, that each and every one who will meet faith's obligation, who will overcome the obstacles, who will press forward unto that God which your word says, we ask you, God, you will bless and show forth the rewards of such faith. Let great faith not just contingent faith, not circumstantial faith, but let great faith be born in the hearts and lives of men and women through your word. And we give you praise, honor, and glory in this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. All right. And we have worship service coming up this Sunday morning, 11 a.m. God bless you. Amen. And there is online giving for those who'd like to uh, give to the work of the Lord here. God bless you.